does that bode, does, are the portents looking good uh, for those that want to see a greater Israel? And, and do they look bad for those that actually want peace uh, between Arabs and Jews? Israeli society has been moving steadily to the right, at least since the uh, second intifada of the year 2000. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this is reflected in the composition of the present government headed by Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, this government uh, contains outright fascists um, like um, uh, Itamar Ben Gvir, who was so extreme he was not accepted, he was rejected for military service in the IDF because he was so ex uh, extreme. And he uh, is someone who used to, his hero was Dr. Baruch Goldstein, the American settler in Hebron who carried a massacre in the mosque in Hebron and killed 29 worshippers. Mm -hmm. This was his hero. He had a picture uh, of, of uh, Baruch Goldstein. So this is the kind of person we are talking about. And another person, um, the finance minister, Betzal El Smotrich, is also an extreme right-winger and nationalist and a declared uh, homophobe. And these two fascists are in the government and they hold critical positions with regard to the occupation. Mm. Um, ben Greer is in charge of the police. And these people have an agenda. It's, it's an extreme right-wing agenda, which involves ethnic cleansing, both from Gaza and the West Bank, and the, uh, ending with the formal annexation of the West Bank. Uh, and if you look at the government as a whole, this is just the most extreme wing of the government, but the government as a whole is the most right wing, the most xenophobic, the most pro-settler, the most anti-Arab, the most overtly racist government in Israel's history. So this is where we are today, after 75 years of um, Israeli history. And as you pointed out earlier, in the 1950s, Israel was an icon of socialism, of equality, of the kibbutz movement. And it's because and Israel was also uh, presented itself as an island of democracy in a sea of authoritarianism. And it's because Israel was a completely, was a different kind of political entity that it received so much international sympathy and support until today. But today Israel has gone too far under this extreme government. And today Israel is alienating the entire international community and public opinion uh, around uh, the world. So Israel is not what it used to be. And this government is really dangerous for Israel and for its future. And you mentioned that Israel was established as a haven for the Jews from anywhere. And the irony today is that Israel has become the least safe place for Jews in the entire world. Professor, in terms of the um, in terms of the the, the movement by the uh, settlers to annex with the West Bank and to create their vision of what should be Israel, which includes the Gaza Strip being um, annexed and, and ethnically cleansing the Palestinians. Do you believe with all the opprobrium that Israel has received, the, the demonstrations, the, the, obviously the referral to the ICC, uh, the Houthis, obviously the militias over there taking action to disrupt shipping, uh, international shipping that is, the Hezbollah militants on the northern border um, almost uh, ready to attack Israel, if you listen to, if you believe Israeli uh, military uh, spokespeople, perhaps. Do you believe that, that the United States and those that are allies of Israel, including this country, the United Kingdom, would allow Israel to then go ahead and ethnically cleanse 
2 million Gazans, perhaps. Uh, we know Smotrich was talking about leaving perhaps 100 to 200,000 Gazans in Gaza and, the, uh, and, and, and to have Israeli settlements. That's, that was his plan. And he, he's quite open about it. And as you said, to then throw out as many Palestinians as, as possible from the West Bank and into Jordan. Do you believe that the international community will allow Israel to get away with that? That's a very difficult question. Um, uh, and I, uh, I have no way of knowing um, how the international community would respond mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. a concerted attempt to um, kick out um, uh, uh, the Palestinians from the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Uh, but what I can say uh, is that so far, Israel has not come under any serious pressure to stop what it is doing. So, and some Israelis are talking about a second Nakba. The first Nakba was in 1948, when three quarters of a million Palestinians, more than half the population, became refugees. Uh, and the name Palestine was wiped off, off the map. And today there is talk in Israel by people in high positions about a second Nakba. Mm -hmm. And I believe that a second Nakba is unfolding in front of our eyes. Now, transfer is a term which is a euphemism for mass expulsion of Palestinians. Transfer has always been an element of Zionist thinking since the late 1930s. Uh, in 1948, during the war, there wasn't a systematic, there wasn't a comprehensive master plan for the expulsion of the Palestinians. But there was a war, and in the course of the war, um, the expulsion took place, that is, the Nakba. And I'm very worried today that the extremists in Israel who want ethnic cleansing would exploit the war mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in order to carry out the uh, design. That is a very, very real danger with people not just like Smotrich and, um, and Ben Gvir, but with people like um, Benjamin Netanyahu as the prime minister. It, does that, would, that, would that still take place even though the Egyptians have said that will not happen, the Jordanian uh, king has said that is a red line for Jordan, almost implying that th they would you know, abandon the peace treaties and perhaps even um, take even more uh, stricter action. Uh, it seems there's, there's a disconnect between the reality of what's the situation in the Middle East for observers like perhaps uh, us and, and, and what these people, uh, the ones that you've mentioned, the leaders in Israel, actually want uh, as a as almost a, a an ideal, a, perhaps a fantasy. Um, uh, for the Israeli leaders, ethnic cleansing is not a fantasy. Uh, it's an operational plan. And for the Palestinians, the Nakba is not a one-off event that happened in, back in 1948. It's an ongoing process, which has accelerated under the present um, uh, government. Now, you're, of course, right to point out that the Egyptian government is strongly opposed to any um, uh, uh, civilians being pushed across the border into northern Sinai. Mm -hmm. It would be disastrous for uh, Egypt if this happened. It would really undermine Egyptian uh, security. And where would they put um, uh, all these Palestinians if they did come across the border into northern Sinai? So Egypt is strongly opposed to such a move. Uh, so is uh, Jordan, uh, is opposed to um, the mass transfer of population from the West Bank to the East Bank, and that would be a violation of the Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty, which legislates against the mass movement of population from one side to the other. That's right. But the, reality, the reality is that 
Israel is a ruthless uh, and aggressive country uh, 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 which doesn't take any notice of international law or of treaty commitments to Egypt or to um, Jordan. And the other thing is that the Egyptian government under General Sisi is in a very weak position because it has a national debt of, I believe, $280 billion. Yes, I mean, that's a huge, huge uh, a, a mountain of debt that uh, the Egyptians have, uh, have got. And I think we've got a slight technical problem. I think uh, Professor Schlein was going to go on to talk about how that debt would that be... Is doing, that it's not out of the question for America to actually um, uh, put pressure on Egypt to accept Palestinians. Professor, I want to go to more about the people in Israel, the Arabs and Jews. Um, I think the Arabs are termed as the 49 Arabs, so the ones that um, remained in Israel um, or remained in Palestine, as they would say, whichever way, uh, whilst the, the, the Israeli uh, nation was born, and obviously Israelis themselves. In terms of uh, over the last few days, there have been large demonstrations by the peace camp uh, coalitions of Arabs and Jews. I've certainly been following that um, myself on social media. Does that point to um, some hope that at least in there is at least uh, an awakening taking place? We know there were huge demonstrations against uh, Netanyahu, although the question of the occupation was certainly off the agenda prior to the events on October the 7th. Uh, my question to you is that the, the, what's the future for Israel itself? I mean, let's, let's leave the question of the Palestinians uh, on hold for now in terms of Israel and its society and where it's going. Do you think Netanyahu after this is toast or do you think he, like he's always shown, great resilience, he will continue? The 1948ers or the Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel are about 1.8 million. They are a fifth of Israeli society. That's not an insignificant proportion of Israeli uh, society. And since 1948, they have always been loyal citizens and uh, accepted to uh, operate within the rules of the democratic game. Mm -hmm. But Israeli governments have rejected them and called shoulder them, both labor governments and right wing um, uh, governments. So they were not uh, allowed to become fully fledged Israelis with equal rights. And the um, um, July 2018 na nation state law says that Jews have a unique right to self-determination in Israel. That means that non-Jews are second-class citizens. So uh, the uh, Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel have always faced discrimination uh, at many levels. Uh, but the current crisis has accentuated the divisions and the cleavage within Israeli uh, society. So it is true that there are some examples of coexistence, of cooperation, of standing together against the Netanyahu government and against the judicial overhaul that he had proposed before this war broke out. There are examples of that, and there are protests now against Netanyahu personally calling for his resignation, uh, and there are also protests against the war. But that's a very limited phenomenon because um, the war has accentuated the division inside Israel, uh, and uh, now there is a danger of a civil war inside Israel um, because there is um, such a shift in public opinion in Israel since the Hamas attack on the 7th of October 
against Arabs in general, and they no longer distinguish between Hamas, between the people of mm. Gaza, yeah. between uh, the Palestinians on the West Bank, and the Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel. There is a really dangerous cleavage in public opinion. And if um, the war spread to the region, it could also spread inside Israel mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. lead to a civil war between Jews and Arabs inside the state of Israel. That's a real danger at the moment because of what is happening in Gaza. Uh, Professor, I, I just want to turn to uh, the, the normalization uh, process which was taking place. Saudi Arabia was rumoured to be on the verge of uh, recognising Israel uh, and, and perhaps having some movement on the Palestinian question. We don't know how strong that was. That seems to be over. Or is it, do you believe, once this is done, that despite so many, despite the death and destruction in Gaza, the 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 other Arab countries um, that are remaining uh, to normalise with Israel will continue that process and perhaps bring on bigger Muslim countries like Pakistan, Indonesia, Malaysia, etc. Let's begin with a bit of historical background to the so-called Abraham. Uh, accords, which were concluded in 2020. There were four peace agreements between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain, mm -hmm. yeah. Morocco, uh, and Sudan. And I don't regard these as genuine peace treaties between societies, but rather transactions between authoritarian Arab rulers in an apartheid state, the state uh, of Israel. And these Abraham Accords were sponsored and brokered by um, Donald Trump when he was prime minister. And Joe Biden continues this policy of putting pressure on Arab states to normalize with Israel. And he put huge pressure on Saudi Arabia to join the circle of Abraham Accords. And there was a deal on the cards. I think it was a matter of weeks before uh, uh, Saudi Arabia was going to sign the peace agreement uh, with Israel. And one of the reasons for the Hamas attack of the 7th of October was to say, we are not finished. We are not defeated. We are not going to be uh, ignored. Um, we are still here and we will continue the resistance and we'll continue the resistance to Arab governments who uh, sign, who normalize with um, uh, Israel. So at the very least, Saudi Arabia had to stop and rethink. But that doesn't mean um, that um, it wouldn't renew the move towards normalization uh, in the future. What we can see is that there is a disconnect between the Arab regimes uh, and the people. The Arab spirit is up in arms. I can't remember any time when people, ordinary people in the streets were so enraged, but what is, was what you were, were so angry at what Israel uh, is doing. And there are protests throughout the Arab world and elsewhere, uh, and the governments are isolated. The governments are discredited. The governments are not doing anything to help the Palestinians. And therefore, uh, Israel's extreme reactions to the attack of the 7th of October has caused a pause in normalization. And I'll make one other point, and that is that use, there used to be a collective Arab position on peace with Israel. It was formalized in the Arab Peace Initiative of March 2002. There was an Arab summit in Beirut uh, at that time, and it adopted what became known as the Arab Peace Initiative. Originally, it was a Saudi peace plan. Mm -hmm. and the, the Arab Peace Initiative offers Israel formal peace and normalization with all 22 members 
of the Arab League in return for an end of occupation and a Palestinian state on the West Bank and Gaza with the capital city in uh, East Jerusalem. This is the real deal of the century. Uh, and Israel rejected it. Israel completely ignored it and continued with the policy of expansion and uh, coloni colonization. So the Arab countries who signed peace with Israel uh, did so as a betrayal of the Palestinians. The Palestinians saw the Abraham Accords as a stab in the back to them, um, and um, the, uh, uh, the Abraham Accords mean peace on Israel's term, peace for peace, rather than peace in return for an independent Palestinian state. And I think this trend is not going to continue after Israel had showed how cruel and vicious it can be towards Arabs.